Penn State On Demand is a service of Penn State Public Broadcasting, and now you can support WPSU when you shop online. Visit WPSU.org slash shop to make purchases from national online retailers, and WPSU will receive a portion of the sale with no extra cost to you. So start your online shopping at WPSU.org slash shop. Presentation of To the Best of My Knowledge on WPSU is made possible in part by support from the Penn State Alumni Association, informing, involving, and inspiring Penn State alumni and students through its publications, programs, and events. On the web at alumni.psu.edu. And from the members of WPSU. From the studios of Penn State Public Broadcasting, this is to the best of my knowledge. Good evening, I'm Graham Spanier. Tonight we'll talk about emergency response. Emergency service personnel deal with an extraordinary range of conditions on a daily basis from mild fevers to severe head traumas. The work they do is challenging, stressful, at times dangerous, and often rewarding. Tonight we'll talk about the work of first responders. You can join the conversation. Call us at 1-800-543-8242. You can also email your questions to response at psu.edu. And now let's meet our guests. Lou Brungard is the Vice President of Facilities and Plant Management at the Mount Nittany Medical Center in State College. He is also an active firefighter and emergency medical technician with the Pleasant Gap Fire Company. Tim Nilsson is the Executive Director of Seven Mountains EMS Council, an independent nonprofit corporation contracted through the Pennsylvania Department of Health to coordinate with regional emergency medical service providers on issues such as training, mass casualty preparation, and public education. I want to thank you both very much for being here. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Let's begin by talking about what an EMT is. What does it stand for and what do EMTs do? Lou? EMTs are emergency medical technicians. Uh, they're trained through standard curriculum published by the Department of Health and offered at a local level. Now we, we hear the term paramedic. What's the difference between an EMT and a paramedic? The paramedic is the next, next level of training. The EMT is about 120 hours. The paramedic is over 1,000 hours. They uh -huh. can actually do invasive techniques such as IVs, such as intubations, um, heart monitoring, stuff like that, that the EMT is not able to do. So when a, a firefighter shows up or a police officer or an ambulance, how do you know what you're getting or don't you? The Commonwealth of Pennsylvania has a tiered response. Uh, that dispatch information is collected at the time of the 911 call. The emergency medical dispatch protocols are followed as close as they can based on the caller's information and they ensure that there are appropriate resources then whether it is law enforcement, the fire department, a basic life support ambulance or paramedics that are dispatched to that incident. Mm -hmm. So. Firefighters and police officers, I assume, have to have some level of first aid training, but they may or may not be also trained uh, at one of these other levels. Is that, that right? That is correct. Is that something that uh, firemen aspire to, and do you know how, how many of them have that training? Uh, it depends on the department. It depends on the area and what the community needs are. Uh, there are fire departments that are much like Pleasant Gap that have an ambulance service attached to it and provide that service. There are other fire departments that are very specialized in fire and rescue response. And when someone calls 911, what happens from the moment of I call 911, I reach somebody, and what happens in the sequence of events once that call is made? They are trained to get whatever information they need to be able to make an appropriate response. So they're going to ask you or talk to you about what's going on at the scene, try and get as much information on that patient as available so that they can then dispatch the proper agencies. Whether you need a basic life support ambulance at the EMT level 
or whether you need an advanced life support ambulance with a paramedic to be able to go, or whether you may even need a helicopter to be able to come in to take the patient to a facility even quicker than what an ambulance is going to be able to do. So based on the information that that dispatcher is presumably trained to collect in the initial phone call, they'll make a judgment about what level of medical assistance would be appropriate? It, it's somewhat of a judgment, but there's also there's a set of dispatch protocols that all the dispatch centers go by. So they have specific questions they're going to ask you, and as they go down through those questions, then they are, are tiered off to, is this a BLS response, is this an ALS response, and then they make the appropriate decisions on that. So as a good citizen, if I feel like I need to make a 911 call, somebody's in distress, there's been an accident, somebody needs medical attention, what kind of information should I be prepared to provide to that dispatcher? What, what kinds of things might I be thinking about as I'm working my way to the telephone or getting a cell phone out of my pocket? Well, what do I want to be able to tell them in that initial contact? The main thing is probably going to be location. They need to know where your location is. Now, it's, it's nice that nowadays a lot of them are, are enhanced 911 systems where as soon as you call in, your address may pop up. It may or may not, especially on a cell phone, it's probably not going to. So you need to be able to tell them where you're at and maybe how to get there. They're going to want to know number of patients. They're going to want to know, is the patient responsive? Is the patient unresponsive? Is the patient breathing? You know, those type of information. Mm -hmm. um, that way they can make those decisions. Now, Lou, you oversee a whole hospital enterprise, uh, emergency response there. Uh, to what extent do you at the hospital know ahead of time what's on the way and what kind of uh, situation to be ready for? So once the emergency medical service teams arrive on site and do an assessment and start the delivery of care in the field in the pre-hospital arena, they then contact the medical center's emergency department uh, via telephone, via radio, and give what we call a patient care report. And that patient care report uh, relays all the vital statistics of that patient, the current condition, the mechanism of injury. So that prepares the emergency room physician and the receiving team then appropriately based on the information from the EMS. Mm -hmm. Is there ever a situation where they hear what's coming in and before people even arrive, before an ambulance arrives, they've already contacted people elsewhere in the hospital or even from home to say, come in, we need you? Certainly. We have different emergency response procedures within the medical center. Uh, some of those are based on the number of patients, the type of incident. If there's a, a significant trauma injury and those patients are coming to Mount Nittany, uh, we do have trauma codes. We do have other emergency response codes in the medical center to get additional resources to the ED. If you're just joining us, I'm Graham Spanier, president of Penn State, and this is To the Best of My Knowledge on WPSU, Penn State Public Broadcasting, and PCN, the Pennsylvania Cable Network. Our topic tonight is emergency response with Lou Brungard, the vice president of facilities and plant management at the Mount Nittany Medical Center and an active firefighter and emergency medical technician, and Tim Nilsson, the executive director of Seven Mountains EMS Council. You can join the conversation by calling us at 1-800-543-8242 or email us at response at psu.edu. I think there's going to be a lot of viewer interest in this topic tonight, so I'm going to open up the phone lines right now and take our first call. It's Dave who's calling from State College. Good evening, Dave. Good evening. You know, in light of the most recent tragedy in Japan, I was wondering with our proximity to Three Mile Island, What's the best way that we can get information about what's going on at the reactor and if there was a problem for us to prepare ourselves and our families here in State College? Okay, good question. Uh, is that a scenario that you've prepared for this far away from the Harrisburg area? We certainly have to understand the hazards in communities that are very close to us, but also that we rely on for resources. Um, so the 322 corridor coming south to north from the Harrisburg area, we have to understand that the evacuation of, of potential contaminated victims uh, or just people seeking safety 
would definitely come this way into our community. Mm -hmm. So yes, we do have to understand those concerns and hazards. It's somewhat of a distant memory for me now, but I was on the faculty at Penn State. I think about 1977, am I in about the right zone with Three Mile Island? And I remember a, a colleague of mine who gets particularly animated very easily came running down the hall uh, the hall of, uh, of our, our building saying, Three Mile Island, Three Mile Island, well, quick, we've, we've got to get out of town, it's bad. Of course, uh, it, it never went that far beyond the immediate mm -hmm. site. Um, but I think a lot of the population doesn't have a good feel for what's at risk and at what distance. There is a health alert network, which is the Han system that the Pennsylvania Department of Health has. Mm -hmm. And should anything happen, that network will alert all the hospitals. The regional councils are usually part of that. Um, the county emergency management agencies will be notified, and there will be press releases and stuff that will go out for that. So I would really think that should something happen around here where there's potential that people would know. It, it would get out fairly quickly. Yeah. Now, we have um, a lot of stuff that you guys brought, and even some special containment suits that were just too big for us to fit all on the counter here. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, there are, perhaps are some emergencies where you might be concerned about radiation or contamination of some kind. And tell us about the suits that you carry and, and when you would put those on. A lot of the suits and different protective ensembles uh, are based truly on the type of hazard that you're dealing with. So whether it's a radioactive material, a corrosive material, or any other hazardous materials, those suits and the respiratory protection devices are very specific. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a full-faced air purifying respirator. So based on low contamination or confirmed environments, something like this would be worn to protect the respiratory system. And you have those in your vehicles just ready to go whenever you need them? Or? The air purifying respirators are, are usually stored and stockpiled for a regional response. Most of the fire departments have supplied breathing air systems or SCBAs that provide a positive pressure environment, which is a highest level of protection. Uh -huh. So this is this will give some protection, but not at the highest level. That's correct. And how hard is it to breathe with, with these? Uh, as the filters become contaminated or even saturated with liquids, it becomes more difficult. So you have to be medically fit. And there has to be a respiratory protection program in place within the departments mm -hmm. to make sure that the wearer is able and capable for that device. Let's talk about some of the other equipment that that you have here. Um, this looks like uh, uh, something that you would use over a, a patient maybe for CPR for assisting in breathing. Do you want to tell us uh, about that and how it might work? Well, provider safety is one of the main things we have to worry about. We, we of course want to make sure that when they go into the scene that they are protected. And this is one of the things we would use as protection for ourselves, whether it's protection for a hazardous environment such as, you know, um, whether it be AIDS, whether it be hepatitis, whether it be something like that, but it's also so if somebody would vomit or something, we don't want any cross-contamination between the patient and the rescuer. So this would allow us to be able to breathe for that person and then there's no cross-contamination there. So we, who's wearing that, the patient or the responder? Yeah, it would go on the patient's face like this. I see. Uh -huh. um, and then there's also ones that are made for even a first responder level that are just a face shield type thing like this and you can get them in a keychain variety so that you have them right on your keychain with you and all you do is you place this over the patient's face and then you would breathe into that so there's no cross contamination there at all. Uh -huh. And let, let's, uh, let's talk about some of the other things you have there if you could you know lift them up a little bit so we can see them on the air. This is what they call an N95 respirator that we would use for something if we're, we're hauling somebody that's possibly a contagious patient and Lou's got one that, that's open there, but this is the way they're sealed up that way. They're, they're, there's no contamination on them or anything. And then once it's opened up, you're able to put that on your face. Uh -huh. You also can put this on the patient's face too. And that way, if, if they're coughing, there's no sputum or anything that's able to get out, it can be contained into there. Uh -huh. And then you have, uh, looks like latex gloves We have maybe? gloves, uh -huh. yes. 
there's the gloves and then there's also you don't forget about the hand washing and this is just this is just a waterless hand wash agent before you touch the patient after you touch the patient you should clean your hands uh -huh. and now this one looks looks a little different here tell us about that this is actually a p100 mask so the filtering capabilities are stronger than an n95 mask so again depending on the particle size or again that that agent or that contaminant that allows you to choose the appropriate level of protection. Right. And this is a big, heavy, serious <laughs> fireman's hat. <laughs> Pleasant Gap Fire Rescue El Brungard. Uh, so it's got your name on it. And uh, it does a whole bunch of, I mean, first of all, I, I don't think people realize how big and heavy Correct. this is. This isn't for weaklings. But you know, you're, you're a pretty big guy. but. Uh, tell us about some of the, the features of this, if I could hand it to you. So in the, the current helmets, there are design requirements. There's a skull cap to provide protection from materials falling downward. Uh, there's also eye protection. And the helmets themselves are just a bona fide hard hat that a construction worker would uh, wear on site. The other turnout gear or protective ensembles for structural firefighting uh, include coats, pants, mm -hmm. the self-contained breathing apparatus. I notice there are there's a place for some. Are those snaps or is that that's just a part of the of, eye protection? Uh, I see. And uh, what what kind of temperature or, or uh, level of fire would would this withstand? Turnout gear is designed to withstand temperatures upwards of 1,000, 1,200, 1,500 degrees, not for long periods of time. Mm -hmm. um, but the newer turnout gear definitely provides significantly better thermal protection. Mm -hmm. that's, that's great. So when a, a, a call comes in to a volunteer fire department, is that Pleasant Gap's a, a volunteer fire department? Correct. Uh, I remember in the old days we would hear something over the radio mm -hmm. that would just tell people some code that let everybody know there was a fire. Now with cell phones, beepers, whatever, mm -hmm. I, I assume you're alerted in some way. What When a call comes in to 911 and it's a fire, what, mm -hmm. what gets set into motion? The Center County 911 Center then dispatches over pagers uh, the location and type of incident that goes out to the individual departments uh, and then as people are available in the volunteer setting as you had mentioned they would respond to the scene or to the department itself, staff the emergency vehicles and then arrive at the incident. So sometimes uh in a volunteer fire department, you would go directly to the scene as opposed to starting at the fire department and... Possibly if the incident is on your way to the station, that's generally accepted, uh, but you don't want to bypass your station. The most important asset sits in the station, and that would be the response vehicles. Uh-huh. Excellent. So you arrive on the scene of an emergency, and there's chaos. Could be fire, could be an accident traffic being held up on the interstate, whatever it might be, what, what do you do first? The first thing for any type of response is to just make sure it's safe. If, if you don't feel comfortable, if you don't feel safe, you've got to make sure that you can get yourself safe, whether that means backing out of the incident and calling police in, or if it's an electrical hazard, you need to call the power company in to get the electrical offers or something. But the first thing you've got to do is before you ever get yourself into that scene, is take a look and make sure it's safe for you and your partner to win. Mm -hmm. And is there a, a difference between when a, a fire fighter shows up versus a, a police officer or an ambulance driver? Uh, is the protocol any different? Absolutely not. Scene safety, your own life safety is everybody's priority number one. Mm -hmm. I've always wondered, you know, I'm I don't know, maybe because of the work I do where there's always turmoil around me on any mm -hmm. given day. I I'm, I'm feel like I'm a bit of an intervener, uh, but not in the way you guys are. So I always wonder as a citizen, if I see something going on, what should my role be other than to call it in? Do I wait around and see if I can help or do I get out of the way and let the professionals 
do their thing. What what do you expect? Uh, what would you like to see happen? Uh, I'd like to hear from both of you on this. When uh, a citizen is on the scene with with something, the nice thing is now all the stuffs by protocol, almost all the stuff by protocol. So when you call in and let them know something's going on, they're going to ask you, is the person breathing? Is the person bleeding? Is those type things going on? Even if you've not been trained in first aid, and it's nice if people take the first aid training or the EMT training or whatever, but for somebody who's not trained at all, they're still able to be talked through. The dispatcher's going to explain, even, even when it comes to CPR, they will talk them through those CPR sequences as long as they're willing to do it. So that's kind of what we would like to see or what we would expect, that Follow what the dispatcher tells you. If the dispatcher says, you know, grab something, control bleeding, we would hope you would do that. And then when we come in, hopefully we're going to assist you in doing whatever you're doing, let you maintain whatever you're doing, and we can maybe do a few other things to help you or assist that patient otherwise. Let you do what, what you're able to do. Mm -hmm. Additional thoughts? And we definitely want you to recognize the scene safety and your safety as well. Um, the last thing that we want is for the incident to grow in size or complexity. So the, the dispatchers would also help you understand the incident if it's more than just a medical emergency. Mm -hmm. Now, I, unfortunately, I know all too well from sort of tracking what happens with college students when they sometimes go to hospital emergency rooms that you can occasionally get uncooperative, violent, hostile patients in an emergency room, and I'm sure that's also true at, at the scene of an accident. Uh, even perhaps people who are injured and claim that they're okay and just want to get up and walk away. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with these violent, uncooperative, hostile type folks? It's such an important piece of even the fundamental training that when we're delivering emergency medical technician training or first responder training, there are elements of that basic curriculum that talk about behavioral health uh, from the responder's perspective as well as the patient encounters. So learning the changes in escalating behavior, able to identify those changes quickly, really can make a difference in the outcome. Mm -hmm. Now how about at the, at the scene? The same thing that was said, but you also, hopefully there's two or three of you there or something because mm -hmm. this person who is escalating that scene, even though they're not the patient, they end up being one of your patients. And it may be, if, if I'm working on the patient, it may be Lou's job, all he's going to do is he's going to stay with that person. He's going to try and calm them down. He's going to try and reassure them. And also that's, able, that's enabling us to keep track of that patient so we know where they're at, or excuse me, that individual so we know where they're at. Um, last thing we want to do is let them loose to be able to maybe get something that would hurt us or hurt the patient even yeah. more. Have you ever had a case where you're trying to intervene in some way, you're trying to solve the problem, give, give medical attention, and some relative or other passenger in the car thinks they know better than you what to do and is yelling at you, don't touch that person, don't move them, don't put it, whatever. Mm -hmm. The big thing is you don't get confrontational with them. If you get confrontational with them, all you're doing is escalating that whole scene. We, we try and, as I said, get one of our people, one of our partners, to go with them, kind of get them off to the side, explain what's going on, and then you can do what you need to do for that patient. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's take a call now. Sue's on the line calling from Altoona. Good evening, Sue. You're on the air. Hi. I just wanted to offer my um, appreciation for all the emergency personnel and firefighters, but especially the volunteer firefighters that are out there protecting their communities. And I was wondering how much it costs to... Um, run a volunteer fire company and where you get your funding. Okay. Well, certainly. Well, thanks for your appreciation, Sue. Um, the funding comes in many different ways uh, from routine fundraising activities like carnivals, bingos, uh, sandwich sales, down to financial support also from the municipalities that we serve. Each department's financial structures are, are different. Uh, and it's based on the municipality's ability and the community's ability to fund that department. Mm -hmm. There are also grants available as well. Uh, the state fire commissioner actually has a grant program that EMS organizations and fire departments can benefit from each year, and the federal government still continues to provide funding as well. Now, when someone calls for an ambulance or EMS service, they get a bill, right? 
Yes, they do. But most of the time that bill, or I don't even want to say most of the time, probably all the time that bill does not cover the complete cost of what that ends up being. Uh -huh. So so just like the fire departments, a lot of the ambulance services, they have to have the hoagie sales and the bingos and all that kind of stuff too. So you two are professional fundraisers then. <laughs> <laughs> That's truly part of the problem anymore, too, because it's not only the training and the responding, but it's the fundraising for a commitment for all the people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, some years ago, I thought it would be a good idea if I was trained in CPR. So I went through several weeks, you know, so many hours of sessions uh, learning how to do CPR. And about once a year, I bring the materials out and review them just kind of re refresh them in my memory. I know I should probably go to a course and be officially refreshed, <laughs> but um, I've never had to use it. But, I, you know, I follow the news and I, I keep up on things. And it seems like every couple of years, some organization changes their mind about how to do CPR w with the chest compressions and the breathing and whether it's one person, two person uh, and, and all of that. Um, what is the latest on that and is there the last thing I read said well there's actually a little disagreement out there about what's the best approach can you give all of our good Samaritans out there a, a, a little refresher on the current thinking and whether you what you practice and whether you agree with it yeah, the American Heart Association has been doing national conferences and they truly look at research to see what is the best for that patient what has what's the best outcome for those patients and they just finished one up. The new materials were just released here two or three months ago. The training materials are just coming out starting next week. But what they're saying now is the most important thing you can do for that patient is compressions. We need to do compressions, we need to do them strong, we need to do them fast, and we need to do them continuously. Um, the, the new standards are saying 30 compressions and two ventilations, if you feel like doing ventilations. But truly, it's the compressions that need to be done if you don't feel comfortable doing ventilations for somebody else, you don't have the pocket mask or anything like that available, compressions need to be done. That's mm -hmm. what's going to circulate the blood. That's what's going to keep the heart viable and so you can get an AED to that patient. Okay, and by compressions, we're referring to chest compressions. Correct. And you're saying that's more important and doing them rapidly is important. Uh, is the specific timing, I think we were taught, you know, one and two and three and so on. It, it, or is it just getting as many in as you can as quickly as you can? They're saying that it should be about two inches deep uh -huh. on an adult patient, which is anyone over eight years of age, and it should be about 100 times a minute. But truly, don't get yourself bogged down on the one and two and three and as much as we need to do them rapidly, we need to do them um, deep, and we need to continue them. 100 times a minute is going to wear even the most fit person out pretty fast. Well, it sure does. I, it used to be 15 to 2 and then went up to 30 to 2. The first time I did my 30 to 2, I wasn't sure I was going to make it. But, <laughs> but you, you get used to it, and then you've got that adrenaline going if it's a real situation. Uh -huh. And you mentioned something interesting uh, about if you don't have a mask or some kind of protection, maybe don't do the breathing. But I, I think a lot of people would be comfortable with the risk of doing the breathing if they thought they could save someone's life. The latest studies have found out that just the compressions themselves, the, the positive negative pressure within the chest from those compressions are circulating enough oxygen to be able to maintain life. Mm -hmm. Would you see it any differently? Absolutely not. They're set by the American Heart Association. The Department of Health recognizes those guidelines. Mm -hmm. Okay. And they may change again. In five years, they're going to take another look at it, and, and who knows? I mean, I'm hearing things that it may be 200 compressions to two ventilations in, in five years. It, it's hard to tell. Yeah. Well, you'd have to be bionic or something to do 200, I would think. <laughs> well, I hear there's good things going on from just this new CPR. <laughs> they're raising survival rates from 8% up to like 35, 40% uh -huh. with because we're getting the compressions in. Okay, and then you mentioned waiting for the an AED device. Maybe you could explain to us what that is, because for a lot of people that's a relatively new thing. They are, um, and they are the real lifesavers. The automatic external defibrillators, um, there's been several different programs to make them publicly accessible. So different areas such as malls, airports, public sports arenas, uh, right down to law enforcement vehicles, fire departments, and even your basic life support ambulances. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so do you attach them to the patient that's unresponsive and pulseless? That computer analyzes the patient's cardiac rhythm and if a, a shock or treatment is indicated, it will instruct you to deliver that treatment. So early defibrillation is one of the chain links of the survival. Mm -hmm. Our next caller is Robert, who's calling in from German. Robert, you're on the air. Thanks for calling. Uh, thank you. Uh, my question is, uh, I'm trying to get into the volunteer uh, company up here, and uh, do I just uh, wait to call them, or do I, or they'll wait to hear from them, or do I just, you know, call them briefly, like uh, once in a while? Do you have? Do they know already that you're interested, and you're just waiting to hear back, or do they not know know about your interest yet? Well, I filled an application out, oh. and I'm just waiting. I heard them to, from them today. Uh -huh. I was just wondering, you know, like, do I have to wait to call them, or do they call me, or? What would you wait. advise on that? Well, persistence is always the best. Mm -hmm. uh, each department has different application uh, processes. Some departments read applications at company business meetings. Um, there would be possibly background checks and other references that are performed. Uh, I would stay in touch with them, Robert. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure after tonight, someone will be in touch with you as well. <laughs> <laughs> All right. If you're just joining us, I'm Graham Spanier, president of Penn State. And this is, to the best of my knowledge, on WPSU, Penn State Public Broadcasting, and PCN, the Pennsylvania Cable Network. Our topic tonight is emergency response with Lou Brungard, the Vice President of Facilities and Plant Management at the Mount Nittany Medical Center, and he's an active firefighter and an emergency medical technician. And Tim Nilsson is with us. He's the Executive Director of Seven Mountains EMS Council. Please feel free to join the conversation. Call us at 1-800-543-8242 or email us at response at psu.edu. And speaking of email, uh, this follows very nicely from the last question that we received. I was wondering if the number of volunteers for firefighters and for uh, other things has been on an incline, decline, or remained the same over the past 10 or 15 years. It seems that everyone is busier than ever these days. Has that had an effect on the workload of emergency response teams? That's a great question. Yes. How, how do you see it in your volunteer fire department? It certainly is a great question. We, over the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, have recognized a significant decrease in volunteerism. Uh, people are, are forced to work two and three jobs. They don't have the free time uh, that folks may have once had that could give back to the community and volunteer in organizations like ours. Mm -hmm. How about in, in your line of work? Any changes? Same thing for EMS. No, it is decreasing. Right now in the state of Pennsylvania, there's about 51,000 individuals certified, either first responder right on through to health professional. Uh -huh. And probably of those, we're lucky if half of them respond. Hmm. And that is down from, from years past. So in for emergency medical technicians, mm -hmm. it, that's the people that you work with are, are mostly in that category. Is that right? Um, first responder, emergency medical technician, and then paramedic, and then there's pre-hospital RNs. Okay. So it goes so you, right on through. You actually have a range. Mm -hmm. But at, in which categories are you mostly working with volunteers versus paid professionals? F the first responder and the EMT are primarily the volunteer uh -huh. areas. There are some volunteer ambulance, volunteer paramedic services, both in the region and in the state. Mm -hmm. So at those volunteer levels, would you agree with Lou's assessment that the numbers are on the decline? Yes. Yes. Well, what do you do to compensate for it? Do, do you go out and actively recruit people? Do you try to promote that activity, or do you just wait for people to come to you? No, we've done quite a few promotions and activities and try and do. The state of Pennsylvania has, has done some things to see what they can do as far as getting recruitment into the service. It's a certification for three-year period. Here several years ago, they went out to the people who had let their certifications expire and said, come back, we need you. What can we do to bring you back? And then they did end up getting quite a few individuals to come back into the service mm -hmm. and started running. Trying to get a hold of the, the younger people too, trying to get them interested 16 or 17 and, and 
get them interested in EMS. And is there an age limit? Well, at how old do you have to be to be a firefighter or to volunteer to, uh, you know, to be on a, an ambulance run? To get the certification, you have to be 16 years of age. Mm -hmm. To be the main attendant in the back, taking care of the patient, responsible for patient care and stuff, 18. So uh, there might be some teenagers out there who'd like to get involved. We would appreciate and welcome each and every one of them. And I know here in State College, uh, perhaps the majority of the volunteer firefighters are actually Penn State University students, mm -hmm. which is, is a great thing. I don't know if that extends out to, to your region as well. We do have some college age folks that do volunteer. Uh, and also help us with staffing our ambulances as well at Pleasant Gap. So it, it's a big benefit, and it's a nice way for people to engage in their community mm -hmm. as well. And that's great to hear. Let's uh, take our next call now. It's Dick calling from Johnstown, Pennsylvania. Good evening, Dick. Good evening, Dr. Spanier. I appreciate you going before the legislature and fighting for our funding. And so well, important. thank you. That's that's a fun experience. <laughs> yeah, <I'm sure>. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, I have a question uh, regarding emergency medical technicians. Mm -hmm. I would like to know uh, a little more about the training and what continuing education is required. And, and I think I read recently where an automatic IV may not be absolutely necessary in many cases. Um, I, I may be incorrect on this, but I, I think that I did read that very very recently. So if you could comment on that, I would appreciate mm -hmm. it. And uh, thank you both for your uh, oh, well, services. Thank you for thank calling you. in. So two questions there. Let's start with the training question first, the training and continuing education requirements. Mm -hmm. The EMT training right now is, is anywhere between 120 and 135 hours, depending on where you take the course. It includes everything from ambulance operations to, as Lou already said, behavioral emergencies, emergency childbirth, treating um, medical emergencies, treating trauma emergencies, lifting and moving patients, you know, a wide range of everything you would need to be able to, to know for basic information for responding out and taking care of patients, transporting them into the hospital. Uh, once you get that training, and as I said, it, it's about 120 hours, you will take a state certification exam, both a practical and a written. As long as you pass that certification course, you'll be issued a card from the Department of Health saying you're an emergency medical technician or you know first responder depending on which course you take. That certification then is good for a three-year period. At the end of that three-year period you can either come back and retake the exams to show you still know the information and you'll get another three-year card or as probably 98 percent of the individuals do now there's a continuing education program within the state of Pennsylvania that I as an EMT as long as I take 24 hours of continuing education over a three-year period. At least half of that has to be in medical trauma information. The rest of it can be whatever, hazardous materials or driving or whatever. But if I can accrue 24 hours or a minimum of 24 hours and maintain CPR, we will automatically recertify their card or recertify their certification for another three-year period. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are doing that. They're on 9, 12, 15 years of recertifications through that continuing education process. Mm -hmm. Now, he, he asked also a technical question about the use of IVs. Yeah, and I'm not sure that I understand his question fully. Uh -huh. um, there are protocols that folks in the field, especially paramedics and pre-hospital RNs, would follow based on vital statistics of the patient, the patient's chief complaint, and any history, and then possibly intervene with IV therapy. Mm -hmm. Any new developments that you're aware of? Not necessarily, no. Now, he was talking about automatic IVs, and I'm not sure whether he's learning... Within Pennsylvania, probably over the next 18 months or something, mm -hmm. there'll be a new level of EMS provider called the Advanced EMT. Now, whether he's thinking that that Advanced EMT and that curriculum is not done yet, you know, I, I, I don't know where he's going with that. I do think that probably over the last 15 to 20 years, you're seeing less use of IV therapy than what there was before. Oh. But I don't know where he got that automatic okay. IV. All right. Uh, let's uh, take a call now from Elks County. Lewis is with us on the line. Good evening, Lewis. Good evening, Dr. Spanier. Thanks for taking my call. You bet. Uh, <clears throat> the reason I'm calling is that I heard that in a little town around Pittsburgh, there's a, a company that's uh, staffed by uh, mainly high school students, and there's one up in Alaska also. 
Hmm. They get trained right right in high school for CPR training and EMT training. I tried to introduce some of that in our town, and uh, they rejected it because they said it would take too long for the training. And I understand it takes two years. I said stretch it out over two or three years. What the heck? And uh, <clears throat> they they still rejected it because of the hmm. funding and such. But I w- wanted to hear your comments uh, from your staff there, or for, from your uh, mm-hmm. uh, hosts, and uh, see if... Uh, see if they had any ideas on that. That actually sounds like a great idea to me. I mean, couldn't you get students trained even while they were 14 and 15, so when they hit 16, they were ready to go? And with the number of hours that you mentioned, I would think that could be easily integrated into an extracurriculum, uh, you know, after high school or even, you know, in lieu of a health class or something like that where... uh, Mm -hmm. They would learn an awful lot and actually be able to help. What What are your thoughts? There are several of the Votex that have the EMT program within part of their curriculum now. Um, Belfont High School, just right here in Center County, they have it as an elective. I think they have to be either a junior or senior to be able to take that elective, and it may be just as seniors, but they offer it as one of their electives, and they have kids taking it. Um, when they graduate from, from high school, then they have their EMT certification. They're volunteering within the communities and stuff. I think it is in either Lebanon or Lancaster that they have been doing for quite a few years now at the um, VOTEC level that mm-hmm. the program's offered. So again, Lewis, please be persistent because those are the future responders that we have looked forward to mm-hmm. to, to welcome into our services. And That's I would, a great I would think in, in terms of cost, there would probably be a volunteer who would be willing to be the one to come into the high school to do the training, don't you think? I think it has to be some other professional staff just because of the, the educational, you know, institute and everything like that. So they'd have oh. to have. But I do know with Belfont, we have guest lecturers that go in and do different lessons for them and stuff. Mm-hmm. But they would have to have somebody hired as part of their staff to be able to do that also. Now, here's, here's a nice question from Judy. I wondered whether the fire and emergency response units have needs for other community volunteers other than firefighters, EMTs, et cetera, for folks like me who would like to help out but wouldn't be physically able to contribute in that way. I thought of that on the way up, and yes, that, that is an important thing. I, I have a lot of people saying, you know, I'd really like to help, but I can't stand the sight of blood, or I, you know, I don't this and that. And, but, but there are so many other things, you know, if, if it's washing the ambulances or helping with the fundraising or, you know, cleaning up the hall or, or billing services a lot of the ambulance services do subscriptions and you know you help enter that information into the computer systems there's all those different things that you can truly be an asset and a benefit to these organizations and not necessarily have to run on the trucks Mm -hmm. yeah now sometimes when i pass a a scene of a of an accident i will see somebody wearing a jacket that says fire police What, Mm -hmm. what is that so those are, are very active members of the fire departments in our area. Um, their primary function and objective is to help isolate and protect the responders of that incident through traffic control. Mm-hmm. So they, they assist and set up the, the scene perimeter and they, they function as traffic control mm-hmm. folks at that point. Now would that be a role that individuals could, uh, if they weren't trained firefighters or EMTs, they could still help with traffic control and and things like that? Most definitely, and there are individual curriculums established uh, for fire police, for highway incident Mm -hmm. scene safety, uh, that they could come and and become educated in those very mission-specific tasks. Yeah. On a fire scene at midnight or 2 o'clock on a December, I'm sure you'd like to have people who just come out and bring you coffee, (laughs) coffee and a donut. (laughs) Well, uh, tonight on our program, email is popular. I'm getting lots of it. Uh, This individual is uh, a lieutenant for the Jefferson Volunteer Fire Department in Coteris, Pennsylvania. And uh, he is saying that uh, in our community, we do not have charges for our services. The majority of our funding comes from fundraisers. We are Mm -hmm. considered a small fire department because we do not have a large population, so we receive very little funding from grants, et cetera. So we were talking earlier about ambulance EMT services where Mm -hmm. a a bill will usually come, but is there ever a charge for firefighting per se? Some fire departments have subscribed to very similar business practices 
uh, and do third-party reimbursements through property and vehicle insurance. Um, so some departments have definitely implemented those practices. Mm -hmm. And if you get a bill, your house was on fire and they came and you got a bill and you couldn't pay it, mm -hmm. what, what happens? Most of those municipalities actually have governing ordinances that they have to implement mm -hmm. uh, that would strictly allow for insurance coverage to provide payment. And then departments typically would accept that from the insurance uh, and then track and write off the balance. Mm -hmm. Anna from Clarion County, you're next in the queue. Thanks for calling, Anna. Hello, Anna. <laughs> I have Hi. a question about the Good Samaritan Act. Okay. Is that still uh, covering uh, any Good Samaritan who comes to assist with the trauma? The current Good Samaritan Act, the way it's written right now and passed right now, covers individuals, there's, there's two different things. For AED, it covers any individual, whether you're trained, whatever. A, a Good Samaritan, if they have an AED available to them and they use that AED, they're covered by Good Samaritan. Mm -hmm. Anything else that says the person must be trained and currently certified and doing skills to the level of that training. There is now being introduced, and I think it's Senate Bill 351, and, and I'm, I'm not exactly sure of that, but there is now being introduced legislation through the American Heart Association and the Pennsylvania Emergency Health Services Council to amend the Good Samaritan Law so that anybody, as long as they're acting in good faith, would be covered whether they're trained or not. And hopefully that ends up passing. So right now, if I show up at the scene of an accident and somebody says this person here is having a heart attack, not breathing, and I remember enough of my CPR that I start doing it, but I'm not currently, uh, I haven't been recertified officially. Am I in some jeopardy? I'm, of course, not a lawyer. Yes. Um, the, the best I can tell you is you are not covered by the Good Samaritan Law. Hmm. Now, that doesn't mean that if you go before a jury of your peers that they're going to convict you of anything. Because, of course, you know, as long as you act in good faith, but you cannot claim the Good Samaritan Law. The, the only thing that you don't need to be trained and currently certified in is AED and hopefully that gets changed. They would convict me for raising tuition, but probably <laughs> not, not, not for doing <laughs> CPR. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so what advice, I mean, what did, we have a lot of people watching. What, what advice should we give them on being a good Samaritan and intervening? What, what would you tell a, somebody just asking for your personal advice on that? I think I would instruct folks to, to seek out a CPR class in their community. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's more beneficial to have the knowledge and stay current with that. You know, in the event that you have a family emergency, early attention, early care is what equals survival. Mm -hmm. So having the current CPR class, it's not that much time uh, at any given time to take the course and they're offered throughout the community routinely. Okay. Now this is the era of HIPAA in hospitals. I, th I think most people have a hundred times already in their lives had to sign a form saying I understand the privacy rules and uh, about sharing information. We get them with credit cards now and of course we have them in, in a healthcare setting. Uh, but what happens at the scene where you have nosy neighbors coming up and saying, you know, what happened? I, I, you're carrying somebody out in a stretcher and they're, you're loading them into an ambulance and well-meaning people want to know what happened, how can I help? Do you worry about those privacy issues in that kind of context? Especially Certainly. in a small community, yes, yeah. you have that all the time. And, and the best thing and what I tell everybody is you, you don't discuss patients, you don't discuss patient care. You know, we saw you at the, the neighbor's house yesterday. Yes, we were there. You know, that, that, that's all I know, and, and we don't discuss those patient care issues. That simple. Don't talk it, about it's it. It's not always that <laughs> simple. <laughs> um, but patient privacy has to be protected pre-hospital. Uh -huh. uh, and focusing on the patient, their needs, and maintaining your safety will, will help you focus that attention. Uh -huh. Here's a, uh, another question from email. Uh, Claudia, uh, if I can paraphrase it, she's uh, 
it says we're in an era of natural gas extraction and uh, to the extent that there might be some uh, emergency there are first responders prepared to handle emergencies that might occur in that context and is there any special training that you're involved with in relation to natural gas extraction? The Office of the State Fire Commissioner has worked with the Natural Gas Coalition. Uh, they have developed awareness level training currently uh, for the responders throughout the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And you know, natural gas extraction is nothing new to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. It's new to certain areas. Uh, but again, the responders have to be able to focus and identify on the genuine hazards, and, and that's the awareness training. It gives mm -hmm. them that awareness of those sites. Now, here's a, a good uh, uh, email from uh, Lanny Ross, Executive Director of the Greater Altoona Career and Technology Center, who uh, says that they they train dozens of high school students as first responders and EMTs who then volunteer in the Blair County Fire Departments. Several have gone on to paid positions in, in that field. So he's offering mm -hmm. that information about the program they have there. And uh, uh, we're now hearing that there are a few of these around, and that might be helpful to the other gentleman that, who called earlier to make the case in his community. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, emergency responders like you two, uh, you want to stay healthy. Uh, but there are there's a flu going around certain times of the year and and uh, what what do you worry about personally so that you can maintain your health so that you can do your job? Being able to understand the personal protective equipment, the proper use, also understanding the the types of patients that you're going to encounter, the types of emergencies. Uh, the the quicker you are to identify the characteristics of the incident, the quicker you are to protect yourself. Mm -hmm. We need to also remember a lot of the providers, what ends up happening with them, it, it's heart disease, just like anybody else. And, and we need to be healthy, living, you know, take care of ourselves, not drink all the coffee because we're trying to stay up and do 38-hour shifts and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. you know, exercise and, and do those healthy living things just like everybody else should be expected to do. Yeah. Now, communities have disaster plans, hospitals have disaster plans, universities have disaster plans, but does this, being in this line of work, do you have your own personal or family disaster plans? Are, are you very mindful of what could happen in your own household and uh, get each other trained or? <laughs> Certainly, um, just as we plan, at your place of employment, we have to plan at home. We always have to have plan B. Um, it's very difficult to keep schedules sometimes. So, for example, our 12-year-old son has a very good understanding of an evacuation plan at our home. So that carries right through. Mm -hmm. We have talked about it. I need to admit that I do not have a written plan. We don't have a written plan, but we've talked about it. Both of our wives are in emergency services also. So, yes, it, it, there, there's a plan there, but I don't have it written down where I can grab it and go with it. Yeah. I would think one of the challenges has to be communications. You, you've got fire departments, mm -hmm. police departments, your ambulance services, the hospital, uh, other resources in the community. How does everyone communicate with each other when there's something that cuts across lines? And, and who's in charge anyway? <laughs> That's the million dollar question, who's in charge? <laughs> the communications isn't, isn't that bad of a deal. Um, communication is always a problem, there, there's no doubt about that. There are a lot of times, as, as many times as not, the communication problem is because there's too much communications. Everybody has a radio and everybody wants to talk on it. Um, the, the way communications are handled anymore between the dispatch centers, um, EMAs, they're able to trunk together those radios so that even EMS has their own frequency normally, firefighting have their own frequency. If we need to talk together in an incident, they can put those two frequencies together so we can talk back and forth. So that's the easy one to handle. The, the who's in charge issue, especially in a commonwealth, that, that's another question. Well, and it comes back to presidential uh, directives 
and the National Incident Management System where depending on the type of incident, again, the agencies involved, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's one person in charge. There could be a team of decision makers. We look back at, at January 6, 2004 with the Interstate 80 accident. Communication because of the different agencies that were represented, within the first 45 minutes we had three different counties represented at that incident. So it became face-to-face -face communications Radios, you know, were put aside because of all the traffic, so face-to-face -face communication became preferred. Mm -hmm. This hour has gone very fast. Yes, it has. You guys are good and do some very interesting and important work, and I want to thank you both very much for being on the program tonight. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you to our guest, Lou Brungard, the Vice President of Facilities and Plant Management at the Mount Nittany Medical Center and an active firefighter and EMT with the Pleasant Gap Fire Company. And Tim Nilsson, the Executive Director of Seven Mountains EMS Council. And thank you for watching. Tonight's program will be stored in an electronic archive that can be accessed through WPSU.org. This site also links to online resources on tonight's topic. We hope you'll join us on Tuesday, April 19th, when we talk about our next topic, online privacy. To the best of my knowledge is a production of Penn State Public Broadcasting. And for all of us here at WPSU, I'm Graham Spanier. Have a good night. Presentation of To the Best of My Knowledge on WPSU is made possible in part by support from the Penn State Alumni Association, informing, involving, and inspiring Penn State alumni and students through its publications, programs, and events. On the web at alumni.psu.edu. And from the members of WPSU.